As to Yemen's complexities, uh, I'd like for you to think metaphorically of the shape of Yemen in the manner of an arm, and let's just say a right arm in terms of uh, from the shoulder uh, to the tip of one's uh, fingers. Now, uh, looking at this map over my left shoulder, or the more colorful one on the right, uh, ponder the following. Uh, the area that the media refers to as being dominated or predominated by the Houthis is in this region here. And it's misleading and unfair and incorrect to refer to them as Houthis. That's the name of a family. And just as uh, Saudi Arabians bridle and bristle when they are referred to as Wahhabis, uh, and they take exception to the individualization of an individual who was a reformer. So too do those who were the followers of this uh, movement uh, that is also reformist or re restructuralist, if that's such a word in concept. Uh, more appropriately, they refer to themselves as Ansar uh, Allah. Uh, the followers of the Almighty. Uh, so I think that, that would uh, help us all to keep things in uh, background, context, and perspective. Now, they seek, as our speakers may allude to, uh, to reestablish or restore the imamate of Zaidi Islam. Now, Zaidi Islam is one of the uh, subdivisions of Shia Islam is by no means uh, the plurality of Shia Muslims, let alone the majority. Uh, but they are the so-called fivers. Uh, the majority of Shia are twelvers. In between the two there are seveners. The seveners are Ismailis. Now the Ismailis in Yemen also. Okay. And there are Ismailis in Saudi Arabia, also, in the southwestern part of Saudi Arabia, near Najran, and in that region. And the uh, Zaydis um, are, as I said, the fibers. And the numbers uh, uh, occur in the following order. Uh, from a Shia perspective, the first Imam, or the first rightful Imam, was Ali. And Ali married uh, Fatima, uh, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. And Ali and the uh, Prophet, peace be upon him, were raised by uh, Abi Talib, uh, the, the Prophet's uncle, because the Prophet was born an orphan in the sense that his father died uh, before he was born uh, to his uh, mother. And so this is a frame of reference why, for many in a traditional context, uh, a man marrying the uh, daughter of uh, one's uh, uncle on the father's side uh, is seen as the most honorable, revered, respected marriage. So we have insight number two in that regard. Now, uh, the second uh, imam from a Shia perspective was Hassan, uh, the son of, elder son of Ali. And the third was uh, Hussein. Uh, and the fourth was uh, Zayn uh, uh, Ali al-Abidin. And the fifth was uh, Muhammad al-Baqir. Uh, but many thought that his uh, brother, Zayd, should be the rightful uh, fifth uh, imam. Uh, but he uh, did not become so except in the eyes of those who believe that he should be the rightful fifth imam. And so the Zaydis as such, or the Ziyud, are those of that uh, school of thought. And theirs is a more militant, prominent, powerful uh, movement element, conceptual uh, school of uh, thought. And it is uh, that school of thought and the institution surrounding it uh, that those of the Ansar Allah seek to restore in uh, the northernmost part of uh, Yemen. Uh, so that's 
where they are located. Now, you think of Asada, uh, which is more in the news than where the Al Houthi family uh, is from. Uh, think of that as the sort of the the ball of the socket of the rotator cuff. And think of Sana'a, the capital of uh, the northernmost part of Yemen, as the bicep, or the muscle, to keep with this uh, metaphor. And then think of Aden as the elbow, uh, using this right arm analogy. And Aden, uh, unless we forget, up until the end of the 1950s, was annually ranked as the in the top five of all the ports and harbors in the world in terms of ships handled and, and cargo tonnage uh, processed. Uh, no small feat amongst the, the world's hundreds, if not thousands, of, of harbors that it was always in the top five. And so among the uh, jewels in the crown of uh, Queen Victoria, or rather the tiara in the middle of her string of pearls of colonial acquisitions and possessions uh, from her ascendancy to the monarchy in Great Britain in the late 1830s was Gibraltar, Malta, Aden, Singapore, and Hong Kong. So Aden was right in the center of this and right in the vortex of west-east maritime trade and uh, east-west maritime trade. There were no railroads then, there were no uh, uh, aircraft uh, then, so uh, you can see in the rearview mirror what people know and knew was Aden. And if Herodotus was correct in stating that Egypt was the gift of the Nile and of a thus, one can stretch that and say that Aden was the gift of the Suez Canal which opened in 1869, having been engineered by Ferdinand Donoseps, a 10-year project. And there are those who would long to see the South secede and restore uh, that part of Yemen to its previous position, place of prominence, privilege, and uh, glory. Uh, if you continue with the analogy, uh, the forearm uh, from the elbow towards the fingertips would be here in this area, uh, which has been the source of much strife, tension, and uh, armed uh, militancy, where you've had uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, achieve a series of, uh, of armed uh, victories there. And then you go further uh, to uh, the wrist, and you would come to uh, Mokalla, which has been seized in recent uh, weeks. Uh, by armed uh, militants, while people were focused on the Ansar Allah uh, and looking uh, away from here, uh, the militants in this area seized that strategic asset. And then continuing to the end, to the tippy tips of the fingers, would be Mahra, uh, this area here which had its first paved road only in the last um, uh, decade, less than the last decade, and whose people spill over into the southernmost parts of uh, Oman in the province of uh, Dufar. So uh, all of these uh, units and each of their peoples strive to be as free and independent as possible and in the realm of national sovereignty, if they could get away with it, and beyond political independence, something in the realm of territorial integrity. Now, those three concepts are relevant here because they are the three criteria for admission into the United Nations, the world's highest political body. National sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity. You have to be able to prove all three. So this is amongst the quest of, of these eight different groups here. Now I'll stop having provided a brushstroke, overly superficial uh, 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 context and background and some perspective, and ask that uh, our first speaker, Noel Rahoney, uh, uh, have his opening remarks. Now, he is not a household name yet in the United States, though he should be. And uh, after this session, uh, probably will be, uh, certainly amongst the specialists in the field. Uh, he, he too has been fortunate to have exposure to South Yemen, uh, uh, working for uh, his country's uh, government, Great Britain, 
and he's no uh, uh, passing scholar or academic. Uh, as you can see from his resume, this man's a leader, and a leader of organizations. Count them on just the bio that you have. At least five in Great Britain. He is had, or has been the national leader of this many different organizations seeking to advance uh, British and the larger Western world's involvement, engagement, and mutuality of benefit uh, with the peoples of the Arab uh, Middle East. He has two books, and uh, both of them are with him here. He's of such self-effacement and uh, self-inflicted modesty that he won't be hawking them, but I will. <laughs> Uh, this is the older of the two, uh, but uh, must uh, reading. And this is the more recent one, an edited volume, uh, Helen Lackner, who's been writing about the region for almost half a century. And while uh, this one is, is must reading, this one is requ required reading uh, there. And I think you can get them at uh, Kramer Books and afterwards in most uh, bookstores where they are being called a bookstore. And please join me in welcoming uh, Noel Brahoni. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Don, for that uh, um, great introduction. Uh, I, I didn't quite recognize myself, but uh, perhaps I am there. Um, I, uh, I could just also say that uh, when I was a, a diplomat in the uh, British Embassy in the, the People's Democratic Republic, um, and uh, when I wrote my book, um, uh, I, I referred to uh, John's writing uh, when he, he he wrote the, the definitive book on the Yemeni Communist Party. Uh, again, this, this, this I mentioned because in, in, in these days we talk about ISIS and AQAP and. Uh, but, but if you go back to the founding of PPDRY, people were the Stalinist, not, uh, Leninist, Trotskyist, uh, etc. Except that I could always tell that if someone said to me, I'm a Trotskyist, and I knew he was from this tribe, and if he was a Stalinist, I knew he was from that tribe, and I'm now from this tribe. So underneath it all, they they, they made tribalism. Just taking the analogy that, that, uh, that has been mentioned, the Regimes in Yemen have tended to start here, um, where you, not only do you have the, um, uh, as mentioned, the Mercedes, but also the largest tribal confederate, the largest tribal confederations. Um, and you have a series of regimes, really going back, we're talking about going back a thousand years, and Yemen has been around for a very long time. Uh, but regimes based here, usually extending their influence to, to this area, which is the old North Yemen, to the richer uh, agricultural lands, because this is a relatively resourceful area, but going to the this coastal area uh, and, and to the south. And then rarely uh, able to go into this area here. Um, I mentioned that because if you look at what's happening now in the last uh, uh, few in year or so, we've had the Houthi, and I'll, call, I'll refer to them as the Houthis, uh, uh, coming from here, going here, and now going there. So there's a historical, a historical link to all this. Um, and the other point is that this area here, when it was united with, um, uh, when Yemen was united in 1990, for the last 25 years, it was the first time that part of Yemen had been united uh, for, for, for the previous 250 years. Um, so that, that these things are remembered and really help form uh, what people think uh, about, about Yemen. Uh, before we get on to the current situation, I'm going to try and talk about how we got, got here. Um, but let's remember that, that, that in, in 1962 there was a, a revolution in, in Yemen, the imam, uh, the imam regime, so, so, which had been there in one form or another for, for, for 900 years, uh, were overthrown, um, uh, followed by a, an eight-year civil war with the Saudis this time supporting uh, uh, the royalists, or basically for most of the time Saada, where the Houthis are, are now, and with a large number of Egyptian forces supporting the Republicans in the South. That ended in a truce, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a peace agreement in, 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 uh, after eight years, uh, and led to, during the, uh, the 1970s, uh, a period of uh, instability. The, f the first president was overthrown in the military coup, and the next two were assassinated. 
And then in 1978, Ali Abdullah who is the, 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 the man who um, is the, was president of Yemen until 2011, took power. Uh, and nobody, when he took over, gave him a chance. They thought he'd be, gay, he'd be gone soon. But he survived. Not only did he survive, he's created much of the Yemen regime, which now survives. Um, and he did so by building a regime, uh, building up the armed forces and, and security for, uh, forces, but uh, populating the leadership with uh, uh, people from his own tribal background and the tribal confederation from which he was based. So he had a, 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 a strong, loyal core, which he could use to extend uh, uh, authority of the, the regime to different parts of the country. But with, within that, he also co-opted um, uh, local leaders, tribal leaders from all over the country in a system uh, which... Um, uh, 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 and, uh, provided loyal, loyalty to the president in exchange for uh, uh, jobs in government, uh, contracts, etc. It was a system that, that embraced uh, 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 the country. And if you weren't prepared to take part in this system, you were excluded, marginalised. And this is what happened to the South and to the Houthis. The marginalisation is a problem in, in those areas. Uh, that's, and within that system, you also... Uh, uh, consistently, I think, followed a, a, a policy I called divide and rule. Um, and in the 1970s and 1980s, the South Yemen, the People's Democratic Republic, was much stronger than, than the Yemen Republic. Uh, uh, and the Marxist um, uh, infiltration to, to the north was a major, major problem. And it's this stage that, that, uh, that, that, that uh, the Salah regime uh, um, fostered the, the, the emergence of a, of a, of a I, I call it political Islam, so I don't want to get too far into the, uh, into the detail, um, that it encouraged uh, politicians uh, who were uh, influenced to some extent by the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, whose, whose ideas are imported by teachers coming from, expelled from Egypt and Syria, and by the uh, introduction of Salafism, largely from, 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 from Saudi Arabia and other places. Uh, but it was given... A, a, uh, it was absorbed within the Salah system in the sense that the uh, part of his system uh, formed, was, was allowed to form a political party called Islam, um, uh, led by one of the, the major tribal figures in Yemen, uh, and it became part of the same system for, for much of the, uh, of the 1990s. You had the GPC, which is the political party he controlled, and Islam, the, uh, the party that uh, emanated from this uh, uh, within the regime. And that worked until uh, the um, 2000s, early 2000s, because although these parties were competing, they also shared in the, in the, in the, in the distribution of, uh, of, of jobs, uh, etc. Uh, and it began to uh, um, split apart uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, first of all, Oil revenues in Yemen, which, which started in the 1980s and helped finance the, 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 the networks, the patronage networks the, um, uh, the, that um, uh, Sala created, and incidentally, a, a very well described by Peter in the chapter in the book, uh, the I'll mention later on. Um, uh, but the finance by oil revenue, the oil revenue started to peak in the 2000s, um, and so it became a competition for resources between the, these two groups, and increasingly a competition between the sons and nephews of President Saleh uh, and other parts of that regime for succession, um, uh, particularly after the death of, of a man called Sheikh al Akbar, who was the, the, the main inspirer of, 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 of Islam and had kept it for peace. And so one saw at the end of the 2000s uh, the breakup of the, of the regime, uh, splits within it, uh, and it's complicated by the fact that between 2000 uh, and uh, 2010, there were six rounds of fighting here by, by, by Houthi rebels um, uh, trying to assert their, their, their rights. So there were six rounds of fighting going on in the, in the, in the two, 2000s uh, as the Houthis emerged. And the Houthis, uh, some people think, I think some evidence is that the Houthis were in, in initially encouraged by, by, by President Saleh to balance the, uh, the, the power of, 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 of Islam. Um, anyway, it came to an end. It, 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 Right at the end of two, 2010, the, the, these conflicts with the regime reached a peak. Uh, and it was that stage that the Arab Spring arrived in, 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 in Yemen. 
very large demonstrations of young activists uh, in the streets. Uh, but there are two aspects to it. Um, firstly, from the very beginning, Islam uh, uh, helped and um, provided tents and support to, to that group in an attempt, attempt to try and capture it. Um, and the Houthis also turned up in, in, in Salah with their own tented camps in, 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 in protest. Um, and, and on March 18th, there was a, 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 a yes, on the 18th of March, there was a, there was a famous massacre uh, when plainclothes police killed 50 demonstrators. And that broke the link uh, between, between Salah and some important parts of the, uh, the armed forces, uh, namely the first armored division, led by a man called uh, General Ali Mossad, who may, may come up later, who had actually also borne the, 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 the brunt of the fighting against, uh, against the Houthis. Um, um, uh, there was an attempt uh, uh, to kill, to assassinate uh, President Saleh in, um, uh, in June 2011, and for a time after that, it appeared that there would be a civil war in Yemen. And it was in that time that the GCC, um, supported by the UNSC, were able to, to get, get in and, and negotiate the, 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 the transition deal um, that, that, that is still existing. Uh, that had three elements to it. Uh, first of all, political. Uh, the, the deal was that President Saleh retires, resigns, uh, and uh, President Hadi, uh, uh, who, uh, who, come, who was his deputy president, he was a southerner, uh, uh, deputy president, who should, should take over, that there should be a coalition government between Islam and the GPC. Um, and there would then be a national dialogue involving 565 people um, and various other groups to, to, to uh, draw up a, 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 a new constitution or to come up with recommendations for a new constitution. But the key part of the transition deal was the military and was, a, a, was, the, was the restructuring of the military and security. And that was to take those networks, as I mentioned, to be out of the armed services, out of the security service, and make them responsible to an elected government. So that the first time you uh, had uh, control of them. Um, but the third element, which actually was, it began earlier, was a process called the Friends of Yemen, essentially that began as a counter-terrorist uh, attempt following, if you remember, the Christmas Day uh, attempt to bring down the aircraft uh, on its way to the United States. Um, um, uh, that, that in effect uh, it promised something like $8 billion uh, of assistance to, to, yeah, to enable the, uh, the, the, the transition to, to deliver real benefits to, to the people. But there are flaws in that, that, that deal, and these have been exposed by recent events. Um, the first one was under the deal, uh, Salah was allowed to remain in, in, in Yemen, and not only remain, but head, as head of the political, main political party. Um, um, the second one, I think, was the, the, the coalition government uh, excluded the Houthis and, 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 and Iraq suddenly. Um, um, the, the, the military uh, restructuring began with generals being moved, but it could never get down to dealing with uh, individual army units and brigades. Um, so the, the effect was that the, 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 the the, the, those um, uh, networks in, within the armed services, within the security service, very much linked to Salah, Salah remain. Um, um, so we had a system whereby the president, the former president, uh, was in power and the network <coughs> supporting him was still there. Um, so you could say that inevitably it was going to, uh, uh, things were, were, were going to go, uh, go, go wrong. I suppose I should also mention that the, um, the that the delivery of money, um, I show that the, well, the GCC states that they part of it, but much of it was not, was not actually uh, delivered. So for most Yemenis have not seen any economic benefit from, from, this, uh, from this transition. Um, the, I just want to go back to now to, to Lujis. I mentioned the fact that they fought that, that the, 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 the six rounds of fighting in the two, two thousands. But clearly the Houthis decided um, sometime uh, around this time of the transition, that they would need to take matters in, into their own hands. Um, and, and I should also mention that, the, uh, as, uh, as John sort of hinted at, the, 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 the Houthis have a number of grievances that, that uh, go back over uh, uh, many years. But these are Zaidi 
revivalists, well, I, I, I prefer to call them, who resented the, the, the growth of, uh, of, uh, of political Islam, Sunni political Islam, uh, in, the, in the 1980s and 1990s. And in particular, I think, took, took exception to the uh, introduction of, of Salafism, particularly in, even into their own areas. They, they saw themselves being challenged by this. Um, uh, and in the fighting went on in the 2000s, the key parts of the army that was fighting with this were linked to, to Islam, under Islam, uh, uh, um, uh, tribal support to, 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 to do that. So this is what, that, so from uh, around 2011, I noticed, and I think others noticed, that the, the, the Houthis were moving from their area into the neighboring provinces, um, into Hasha towards the sea and, and towards al where the, the uh, or, or, or the gas was, was served. Um, uh, it was slowly done, but it was built, building up very slowly. And Ansar, uh, a lot of the political party which they um, uh, um, uh, set up, be began to be active in different parts of the country, including uh, the Sunni, Sunni parts of, of, of Yemen. Um, but it was uh, the uh, outcome of the National, uh, National Dialogue Council, uh, which I think particularly upset them, because it produced. Uh, 1,800 recommendations for a constitution, uh, which is now being drafted, uh, uh, which has 450 uh, articles, I believe. Um, uh, uh, but in particular, it came up with a, 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 a decision that should be a federal Yemen, um, and that one and that, and that one of those uh, federal regions, Azal, which were the Houthi area, would be included. Uh, was, was limited in size. It, it, it excluded in particular from access to the sea and access to, to oil and gas, uh, gas wells. So that they, they had resented this whole process, uh, which they, they saw as further marginalizing. Okay? Um, but what then happened was, uh, during two, two, uh, when the, the Constitution was finally uh, uh, produced in early 2014, one saw a rapid change in, in Houthi tactics. They moved down into the, um, uh, uh, the moved towards Sana, challenged in, in particular military units uh, close to, to Islam, and by uh, uh, September uh, 2014, they reached Sana and in effect had taken day back. Now, throughout this progress, they were assisted by military units linked to the former president Sala. And so it's become quite clear that, that, that there's been a uh, some sort of pact between the two of them. This, is, this has been a major factor in their success. They also adopt, but they also adopted populist policies throughout this uh, uh, <coughs> campaign against corruption, uh, um, uh, uh, campaign for the uh, production of uh, for, uh, production of oil subsidies, which, which have been increased. But trying to uh, give themselves a populist position and appeal to a wider, a wider electorate, using it and start a lot political party. Uh, to do so. I know it's sometimes uh, portrayed that the, that the Houthis are just malicious coming out of uh, Sanat. The Houthis have been very deeply involved, say, for the last 900 years in tribal politics in that area. They know how to build tribal alliances. And one has seen throughout their expansion, um, not just in conquest, but doing deals with, 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 with tribal groups to say, you will not oppose us in this area, uh, or we might help you. And this is going on now, and you can see. Uh, the success. Uh, um, the, the, in, in September 2014, they signed. Uh, they forced President uh, uh, Hadi to sign the um, what's called a Peace and National Partnership Agreement, which actually gave them most of what they want. Um, but um, uh, 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 President Hadi implemented his part of it, but the, 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 the didn't. And then became clear that they were, they were using uh, prepared to use force after force. To try and get their, get their way, and it was um, it was that continuation of force that, that uh, eventually led to the resignation of uh, President Hadi um, um, in January uh, uh, of this year. Uh, and also in parallel with this, one saw the Houthis moving into new areas of Yemen, moving into Hadeza, the, the coastal strip down here, uh, and into this area. Following that pattern that I mentioned in, 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 in the past, and more recently, they've been moving into into the south. Um, I'm going to stop here uh, because I think the, the next step will be to look at what has happened subsequently. But this is the background to the situation, uh, what, 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 how we got there and why we're now in this 
round of fighting. Super. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grahani. Very much. Uh, we next time uh, we'll hear from uh, Ms. Uh, Sama Al Hamdani. Uh, she's uh, graced this uh, dais uh, before. Uh, she's a very articulate spokesperson on behalf of uh, understanding uh, numerous complex issues, not least uh, human rights uh, issues and uh, uh, the political implications of much of what is happening and not happening in Yemen. Uh, Ms. Al Hamdani who has a logistical challenge um, uh, with regard to uh, a flight awaiting her as a passenger uh, to uh, proceed to Houston, where she will be addressing one of the country's uh, largest and uh, most uh, dynamic World Affairs Councils in Houston, uh, Ms. al -Hamdani. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Anthony for that great introduction and for uh, laying out what Yemen is. Um, I also would like to, that, to thank Dr. Brony for giving us the historical background. Um, good morning. I know it's early in the morning and this could be a bit heavy. Um, to those of you who are fasting, Ramadan Kareem. I know it's, it's rougher in the morning. Um, I want to talk about the war right now in Yemen. Uh, it's been 94 days of warfare, and it seems that this war has been set up to take a lot longer than it needed to take. Um, a lot of us at first thought that this would be an operation that would have three stages and then would end with specific goals. As the war continues to progress, um, we don't know how long this war will take, and it seems that a lot of the parties are preparing themselves for something a bit longer uh, than usual. Um, having said that, I'm particularly concerned about the nuclear deal, deal being signed because it could mean that Iran would actually actively participate, decide to participate in Yemen, although so far they have not participated as a proxy. Um, and so when I look at Yemen, I think of all the destruction that is taking place right now, and it's due to main uh, reasons. The first reason is the attacks that are uh, led by Saudi Arabia and its coalition, and the second reason is the internal war aggravated by the presence of the Houthis in locations where they do not belong. And so right now we have a civil war in Taiz, in Aden, in al Dada, and Dahj. Uh, we have cities like Sada completely destroyed uh, for having Houthis as a, uh, as a base there. Uh, what we witness in these cities are deaths, injuries, uh, displacements. We have child soldiers on both sides. And we have schools that are occupied, and, and so no children are going to schools. People are not going to their jobs. And hospitals are being targeted, uh, unfortunately, by both sides, whether it was intentional or not intentional. The only difference I can point out here in terms of the devastation that this is causing is that the Houthis on the ground are arresting activists and journalists who speak against them. And the Saudis, on the other hand, are destroying historical sites. Over 25 sites have been destroyed, including um, the site uh, where the Queen of Sheba was, uh, some houses in the old city of Sana'a, which are a UNESCO heritage site, and a museum that hosted uh, artifacts as early as the third millennium before Common Era. And so, uh, we have a very tense situation on the ground. If I am to look at the south of Yemen, although the binary of uh, south-north Yemen does not really exist anymore, regionalism in Yemen has taken uh, a more complex form in this war. But to look at the south, uh, they are suffering from uh, the reemergence of old diseases. Um, and so a lot of people who are not being killed by the fighting are being killed by illnesses, uh, like the dengue fever, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly in English. Um, and so you have people dying from these illnesses, people being dislocated, specific neighborhoods being entirely demolished. Uh, for example, in Aden, the city of Khurmaqsar is, is uh, destroyed. There are many, many deaths in Crater. Uh, all of Yemen is suffering from lack of electricity, water, um, and so these basic services are barely reaching anyone. Uh, there's a general lack of medical supplies and food. Inflation is extremely high. Uh, right when the war started, a small, uh, a small carton of yogurt cost more than a dollar. 
And today, as of today, uh, we're talking about how hard it is it's going to be to, uh, to, to, to afford water. And so 30% of the people's income is going to go towards trying to purchase water. Um, so the situation on the ground is really bad. Uh, to go back to the south, the Burekha port in Aden uh, was shelled and attacked, um, and the refinery was targeted there and has been burning for a day. So also in the, in the north of Yemen, you have the bombing of uh, weapon depots. Uh, both these actions have one thing in common, in that they are destroying the Yemeni environment and are going to probably result in, in other illnesses that are to come in the future. Uh, in, Ta in, in Taiz, in the city of Taiz, which used to be the capital of the north of Yemen in the past, uh, there are several deaths from snipers and conflicts on the ground. Um, besides all of this, we have uh, something new. Uh, we have the war on terrorism, which started in Yemen as early as 1992. But right now, it seems that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has, uh, has been able to gain the city of Hadramaut, um, they have taken over the presidential palace there and have rebranded themselves uh, as locals uh, where they would have people presenting them and they would kind of uh, be in charge in the background. Uh, the worry about this is that Hadramaut is uh, the richest governorate in Yemen in terms of oil. And uh, having <coughs> the oil in the hands of Al-Qaeda means a disaster. The problem with this war is that uh, those the Saudi-led strikes are actually working for the favor of the Houthis in that they are recruiting more people to fight alongside of the Houthis, especially if these airstrikes miss and target civilians. And the problem with the Houthis' behavior launching attacks on the Yemeni people on the ground means that they are helping Al-Qaeda recruit more fighters because technically on the ground you have two forces that are fighting each other, and that is Al-Qaeda versus the Houthi forces. The government's presence on the ground is not there. So Yemen's government is right now in Riyadh. Uh, President Hadi has continued to issue um, um, appointments from Riyadh, but the problem with this is that they do not have any presence on the ground, being the least legitimate party on the ground. So locally, on the ground, there are forces that are fighting the Houthis, but not for the sake of uh, the legitimacy of President Hadi, but rather for the sake of their local leader or for the sake of just pushing this intruder out. Um, and so when we talk about Yemen's government, there needs to be a plan, and this is where the U.S. can put on pressure in that uh, the Yemeni government needs to be present on the ground, and it needs to represent all Yemeni people, regardless of uh, their religious background. Um, so at the moment, there are conversations about uh, Yemen changing its currency or uh, um, kind of uh, moving on to federalism. And I think that these conversations are premature in light of the war that's taken place. Uh, the ma the mo most important thing that needs to happen is that these conferences and dialogues that happen between Yemen's government and uh, the Houthi militia need to be actual dialogues and conversations rather than negotiations uh, on how to force one or the other out. Um, unfortunately, the Houthis' pl uh, presence in Yemen has, has grown and they are an effective agent on the ground, which means that any negotiation is going to have to include Houthi participation in the government. Otherwise, this war will not end. Um, at the moment, there is no accountability from either side on the crimes that they are committing in Yemen. It's very hard for journalists to go into Yemen to cover what's going on in an ethical and responsible way. Uh, the news has covered uh, the events in Yemen uh, as a form of propaganda. Um, it's unfortunate to see different sites either ignoring Yemen altogether or just promoting one side over the other. Um, so. Talking about all of this, Yemen does not look like it's in, in good shape. And so what's different about Yemen here than Syria or uh, Libya is that there is a potential for actual peace. Um, unlike Syria, the Iranians are not actually fighting in Yemen right now. Um, unlike Libya, Yemen had a civil society uh, platform that, that existed before and we had a multi-party system, meaning that going back to civil life is a possibility. Um, what is happening now is a catastrophe considering that Yemen, Yemenis are facing famine. In 2011, about 9 million people were facing famine and now they are 21 million. 
uh, 21 million out of an approximate 27 million population. Um, and so I think it's in the interest of everyone actually to save Yemen here because we don't want it to be another failed scenario like uh, Libya or Syria or Iraq. Um, and, and this situation can be saved. I think uh, creating an environment where the Yemeni people can go and work uh, is in the advantage of everyone. Uh, previously, Yemen witnessed a five-day ceasefire, um, and that was from the Saudi side, which actually helped a lot uh, in the sense that it normalized some people's lives, some people were able to move from one city to another, although that is hard right now because uh, gas is really, really, really hard to find, so you can't even get a car and move to another city. Uh, what's important is to have an evacuation plan for the civilians, uh, for countries to start accepting refugees. Uh, I just read earlier in the morning about refugees who camped at the Saudi border but were not allowed to go in. Um, and so there needs to be a plan for refugees, um, another ceasefire, a plan to move people out of danger zones and to, in to intensify the assistance in, in terms of uh, food, water, aid, medical supplies, and that's the only way that Yemen could move forward. Everything else that is political will have its time and chance. Um, I hope I didn't speak for too long, and I hope I made all my points. I know that the following speaker, uh, Peter Salisbury, is going to uh, definitely go into depth about the economy, and he's lived in Yemen, and so he knows what he's talking about. Um, thank you all for being here, and I hope that that added to your understanding of what this war is doing in Yemen. Uh, next, we have uh, Peter uh, Salisbury, who, uh, as uh, Ms. Al Hamdani rightly uh, noted, uh, has been focusing on the contemporary situation in terms of its uh, dynamics on the ground. He's uh, well known for those who um, read the publications on the eastern side of the Atlantic, uh, especially for the Financial Times. Uh, but has been on the ground and traveled extensively in the country and uh, met with and been briefed by uh, numerous of uh, uh, the players, both uh, official as well as uh, non-official, uh, Peter Salisbury. Thank you for having me. I know I'm the last speaker and attention spans may be wavering, but stick with me, I'll try and be brief. Um, before I start speaking specifically on the, the economic and humanitarian situation, I want to speak um, very quickly about a problem that I personally have noticed, not just with respect to policy making on Yemen, but within the, the wider region, and that is a tendency towards what's known as optimism bias. Um, throughout Yemen's transition, certainly, um, with my, in my capacity as a researcher and analyst for the Chatham House and work that I've done for the UN, for the World Bank, one thing that I've noted again and again is a, uh, a recognition among people doing work in countries like Yemen of the real dynamics on the ground, which are then swiftly put aside when policy is actually being conducted. And again and again we hear the phrase, we must assume, we must assume, we must assume. Now, at this moment in time, when I speak to people talking about economic policy, political policy, and other policy on Yemen, what I hear again and again is, we must assume that there will soon be a peace deal for Yemen. We must assume that it will be easier to access Yemen soon. We must assume that all parties will lay down arms soon. And I'm afraid to say that that is just hopelessly optimistic at this point in time, and that any real conversation about Yemen right here, right now, Although we must hope for peace in the future, we must recognize the likelihood of a long, protracted, and bloody conflict in the country. Um, despite the mitigating factors that Samar mentioned, what we're seeing is an increasingly regionalized, increasingly polarized country, which is poorer and hungrier every day, but is angrier every day at the same time. And that anger goes in different directions. Um, that's, that's the first point that I really wanted to convey. It's not a positive or optimistic message. The future is what I'm going to say about the economy, I'm afraid. So one of the things that, that really hasn't got as much coverage to my mind as it should since this, this um, conflict began, if we can say that it only began um, at the beginning of this year, is the economic and humanitarian situation in Yemen. Um, and what I'd like to do very, very briefly is try and explain to you why the situation is as bad as it is 
and why people are now publicly having said for a couple of months that it's a possibility, talking about the potential for a real famine in Yemen, for people simply not having food at all. Um, so a very, very quick crash course in, in Yemen's economy. And so the 1970s, 1980s, Yemen really um, had an economy that was based on agriculture, be it subsistence or sale, and trade um, among the, the main ports and, and central cities of, of the country. And a country in, in which in the northwest, as Noel talked about, you had two major sort of tribal confederations in, in the northwest who were able to sell their wares effectively as, as mercenaries and as power brokers and were able to maintain power and have some kind of economic advantage from that. But realistically, most people made money from either growing and selling food, assisting on the food that they, they um, grew and sold, or from trading goods outside the country and across the, the region. And very well they did too, particularly in the port of Aden in, in the south. But we saw several different key events in the early 1990s that really shifted the, the political economy and the economy. Now, up to the 1990s, because you had this quite diffuse economy in which people made money on the basis of their, their family, their local society, their tribe, and their, their wider economic unit, and because people were making money also from remittances that were coming back to families from outside of the country, the economic power of the central state was quite limited. It didn't have very much to spend, and it didn't have the ability to raise taxes on a, on a huge level. And in fact, one of the reasons that the 1962 civil war broke out was the attempt of the MMA to create a system in which taxation was imposed on mass. Now, in the early 1990s, several different things happened to really change the way that that structure of economic power worked. The, the first of which was um, Ali Abdullah Saleh's inadvertent, supposedly, but nevertheless his support for Saddam Hussein in the, the Gulf War, Gulf War I. Um, and he, his decision to do so saw so one million Yemeni workers repatriated, and with them, a complete cessation of the flow of remittances that had been so important to Yemen. Now, the other thing that happened around the early 1990s was a gradual increase throughout the 1990s, with a few blips, of the oil price as Yemen became a substantial, if not a major, oil exporter, oil producer and exporter, which meant that for the first time, decent amounts of money were accruing to the central state. Now, the third important event was the 1994 civil war, in which we saw the various parts of the northwestern regime that Saleh had built up over the previous 20 years consolidate power over the, the entire country, but also over violence, if you like. It created a semi-monopoly over violence within the coalition that Saleh had built, but also over the economic assets of the state. So the, the former assets of the PDOI came entirely under the control of this central elite, and it meant that they had an economic monopoly. They had things that they could use to, to bargain. Um, we saw neoliberal economic reforms in the late 1990s that saw trading license imports and exports being eased up. We saw those being used for, for patronage. So if you were a friend of me and the regime, then you get an import license or an export license for X, Y, or Z good, and that brings you money. And at the same time, from the late 1990s onwards, we see that the Saleh regime increasingly using the receipts from oil revenues to build up a massive patronage network, which, as Noel says, I, I discuss in the book coming, uh, forthcoming in, in September, which I'm on the flyers for here. Um, and what that means is Saleh is in a position from the mid to late 1990s into the mid 2000s to buy people up. And it also sees various people who previously had positions of power based on their esteem in, in society, being gradually brought into the center of the country and divorced from their local communities. Be it sheikhs, be it people who um, work in major trading communities, politicians, and so on and so forth. So we see this, this centralization of power in Sana'a in a way that, that, despite the way we might assume about a country, a country like Yemen, um, hadn't really happened henceforth. But then we see another shift from the early 2000s onwards when oil production starts to grow up, and everyone sitting within the central regime realizes that although the, the pie is growing because the oil prices are increasing um, for, for much of the, the early 2000s, that pie is going to shrink eventually. And we see this competition for overall control of the central state. We exist in what Douglas North, the political economist, would describe as a limited access order in which oil rents um, have been used to buy an unsteady piece but there is a gradual shift, as Noel described it as well, 
in his presentation towards centralization and one group trying to maintain its control over the state. So we see Saleh trying to change Yemen from this relatively collaborative, cooperative <coughs> state into a, a state in, in which just one group, which is his family, controls the entire state. And that really brings us up to, to 2010. Um, but what we also see happening in, during this period is an increasing dependence on the availability of cheap fuel to produce water and to transport goods across the country, and the ability of the, the state to underwrite through dollar revenues, through, through its, its access to foreign capital, is used by oil to import food. So by the, the eve of the revolution um, in 2011, Yemen imported 90% of its wheat, 100%. Um, sorry, 90% of its uh, wheat, 100% of it, its rice, which are staples in, in the, the way that people eat on a day-to-day -day basis. And in 2011, we've got a little preview of what's happening right now, which is an attack on an export pipeline meant that there wasn't enough oil in the country to produce the oil required to keep the economy moving. It also meant that the state wasn't making as much money from oil and started in fact losing money because it was having to import food and it was spending its dollars, selling them into the market so people could import food. And we saw, because of the violence across the country, various networks of transport being cut up. So all of a sudden we see increases in the fuel price, increase in the water price where it's available, and increase in, in food prices across the, the country. And people start to get really, really hungry. Now, since 2012, there's been very little change, realistically, in this overall political economy, other than there's been a mad scramble for everybody involved in Yemen's political system at an elite level to control as much resources as possible. So when we saw this new coalition government being formed in uh, late 2011, we hoped that the, their first order of business was going to be reforming civil service, reforming the subsidy system, cracking down on corruption. Instead, they expanded the system of patronage, where every single group tried to control the ministry to get as much out of it as possible. Everyone started trying to get money, and everyone started trying to extract rents, while doing nothing, even less than the Sala regime had done, to provide basic services for Yemenis on a day-to-day -day basis. And this really, really creates, helped create the context in which the, the Houthis entered the scene. Um, one of the stories I, I hear again and again as I, I travel around to conferences and then events like this is people telling me that Yemen was going through a wonderful democratic transition and then the Houthis arrived. Now, I'm no fan of the Houthis. I don't think they're a very nice bunch of people <coughs> at all. Um, but at one and the same time, that is a completely misleading um, characterization of Yemen. Frustrations were at an all-time high um, by early to mid-2014. I was living in the country. We were having, we were experiencing massive electricity blackouts. People were hungrier and poorer than they had ever been. And that was the case. And this, again, when we circle back to this question of optimism bias, when we talk to the major international powers working in Yemen, they tell us, but yes, we're building a new political society. So in maybe five or 10 years, things will get better. The problem being that no one had very much patience for five or 10 years by that point. They'd been promised enough of the future, and they wanted the present. Now, coming to, to where we are today, I think we've heard enough about how we got here in terms of the fighting, the violence, so on and so forth. What's happened within the economy and within the political economy? Well, we've seen Saleh in, in many ways actually achieve the, the project that he began in the early 2000s, in that one coalition of forces really has a, a, a ramrod stiff control over the central state, which is this coalition of the Houthis and Saleh. But Saleh and the GPC, his party, have a much better knowledge of the, the, the levers of the state, the levers of the economy in Yemen, and therefore actually have a much tighter grip than they ever had over the, the central state right now. Um, and the Houthis who came in with this anti-corruption rhetoric, with this we're going to end corruption in Yemen, quickly came up uh, against a lot of problems. So I remember being told at the end of last year, I'm going to wrap up very quickly, I'm sorry, um, I remember being told towards the end of last year by someone with the Ministry of Finance, that the Houthis had arrived and said, OK, let's get rid of these ghost soldiers, these fake military officers and fake soldiers who've been such a source of expense for the state, so such a source of patronage. And military generals sit down and they say, OK, here's a list of the, the people who make the most money from corruption within the military. And, uh, of course, 80% of these people are the guys who have been backing the Houthis, who have helped them to their current success. So they've done absolutely nothing to deconstruct the, the networks of patronage of the Salah era. And in many ways, they've been reinforced. While Islam, Ali Mossen, 
the, the people who would describe as sort of the, the conservative Sunni bloc within Yemen have in effect been removed and abstracted from the, the political economy and are now trying to come in with their own winner takes all attitude. Um, we see that Salah and his, his sort of core group now with the Houthis are trying to replicate the, the old system rather than build something new. And the rest of the country is starving more than ever. The Saudi blockade means that not very much fuel, if any, is getting in. Um, food is coming in very slowly. Um, I know that people um, from, from the UN, from, from various Western embassies, are quietly very, very upset about the slow pace at which the Saudis have learned to stop and search uh, boats, and are seen as being very obstructive. But the lack of fuel means that there's a lack of water, and it means that inflation, as Samar said, has been incredibly high. But also the, the violence, the destruction of infrastructure, means that, to give an example, if I'm a small farmer of wheat, and I depend on being able to get diesel to my farm, to a generator, to pump water, to grow a crop for the next growing season, to get it on a truck to back to market, that means that I'm about to have no water to grow my crops, which I wouldn't be able to transport to market anywhere. So what we're doing is we're moving towards a point where very little food is coming into Yemen. Where it is, it's so expensive that it's unavailable to the average Yemeni. And at one and the same time, people are unable to, to live beyond, I think, the next two or three months in terms, in terms of subsistence farming, apart from those who can rely on rain-fed farming, which is a very limited number of people by this point. So we really are moving towards a very, very catastrophic uh, situation in, in Yemen. Okay, I've spoken for too long. Thank you very much. Uh, no, well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh We uh, have now a discussion period, and uh, for context, uh, and, well, actually for, for process, please uh, fill out one of these three by five cards and, uh, and wave your hand up, left or right. Someone will collect it and, and funnel it to me. I'll do my best to uh, ask as many of them as I have received as possible. And we have, um, as a matter of policy, uh, we don't have microphones in the aisle, et cetera, because with our experience is that people tend to give a, <laughs> want to try to give a speech uh, from the floor. Uh, and their speech is, uh, well, the speakers didn't say this or should have said that, et cetera. Um, and that takes up a lot of time, resources, as well as uh, a fair amount of hot air. And we try to uh, focus it a bit more on uh, responsible questions that indeed are questions, not statements. And uh, when we started our policymakers' conferences, we did so for a reason, to contribute a public service uh, for what was not uh, at the time being done. We asked foreign service officers what uh, uh, could be done that would most help. Uh, that was not being done, and uh, almost to a woman and a man, they said, no one gets us outside of our offices, away from our desk and uh, typewriter, whatever, uh, to pose uh, questions that have no yes or no answer. And so uh, there are five W questions, and they're tough as can be. What needs to be done? Who needs to be do uh, uh, doing it? Uh, why does it need to be done? When does it need to be done? Where will we be if we do it? Where will we be if we don't do it? And uh, six, sometimes, another W question, whether anything needs to be done. Because of the adage that um, if something's not broken, don't try to fix it, you make it worse, or you could make it worse. But the more vexing one of all is not a W question, it's an H question, namely, how? There is no um, inexpensive or cost-free answer to most how questions. So we ask the W questions, we ask the H questions. Now, uh, the ones I've received thus far are all uh, uh, relevant here. Uh, uh, Dr. Alhamdani, perhaps I'll ask you because you have the more pressing uh, logistical uh, challenge there. Uh, pardon? No, she's already gone, so that's a little difficult to ask her uh, <laughs> questions. But I can ask her the more uh, uh, tricky ones so that uh, her absence uh, reflects that she didn't um, 
Uh, why don't you take on that question? Um, and so we're, we're yeah, thank you. Uh, we're, we're limited to our two uh, remaining uh, stalwarts. My goodness, look at the questions coming up here. Uh, it shows uh, how much you have generated in terms of uh, topics of interest and uh, value there. Um, well, we'll ask questions uh, that uh, may have been directed to her, and I'll try to fuse them so as to limit the degree of repetition there. Uh, how does one feel Oman has performed in its role as intermediary between the GCC and uh, Yemen uh, and or the Iranian component of this larger uh, dynamic? Uh, both uh, speakers have alluded to this uh, at the edges, but perhaps we can uh, focus more uh, near the center on this. If you think it's more central, then it's been marginal there. Uh, and also, um, how would you assess the GCC's uh, position and policies as a whole in its effort to uh, counter the current uh, instability? And uh, how might the GCC countries deal with this question of refugees from Yemen? Uh, we'll ask these three, and the two of you please, uh, to the extent you feel comfortable and inclined, um, address them. Either of you can go first. No. Yeah, yes, yes, from, uh, from the, uh, the dais, if you will. Oman, Oman has played a, a very interesting role, I think, in this, in that it, the, the. Sorry, Oman has played a very interesting role in, in that some, some of the negotiations, uh, the street involving the Houthis, that led to the first. Around the, uh, the failed uh, uh, attempt to set up a, a peace conference, which um, uh, was done through, through Oman. Oman has always maintained very good relations with, with, with Iran. Has act, act, often acted in this way as an intermediary between the GCC um, uh, and uh, um, uh, Iran itself. Um, and it's been help, very helpful in this. On, on the Iranian uh, aspect, Peter written a paper on the Shadow House, so I, perhaps he should say something about this. But from my perspective, what, what the Iranians have been doing in, in Yemen has been pretty low risk and, and uh, low cost so far. It's part of the, the, the what's going to call the regional Cold War with the Saudis, uh, which, which has been much more important in places like Syria, Iraq, and, and Lebanon. Um, but there's, there's certainly been some uh, Iranian assistance going to the to the Houthis. The Houthis, I think, were part, partly inspired and to some extent by the, by the Iranian Revolution. Um, um, and there's been, I think, a, 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 there's been a, a, uh, an increase in the capacity of the Houthis in the last few years, which has probably been something to do with support from Iran, um, uh, possibly by, by Hezbollah. But up till now, it's been, let's say, low, low risk and low cost. And when, when there were attempts, uh, to, to send humanitarian aid into, into uh, 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 Yemen uh, earlier this year, with the threat of perhaps accompanying with naval ships, uh, uh, Iran backed back away when uh, uh, they were told no, and in fact followed uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the GCC guidance and, uh, and, and deposited their, their, their effort elsewhere. Um, but as I say, so far it's been low risk, low, low cost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Um, as Noel says, um, Aman has played a, a very interesting role thus far um, and definitely is, is a useful um, mediator because it can be an interlocutor with both the Saudis and the Iranians. And realistically, the elephant in the room in Yemen is the fact that this isn't going to reach the point where there is a peace deal. And that's realistically, to a greater extent, the Saudis than the Iranians. Um, decide that it shall be so. Um, the Omanis are also interesting because they have a, a good understanding and a better line into the dynamics in the south of the Yemen than I believe that the Saudis do. At the moment in, in Riyadh, um, the Saudis have a number of the old Sultanli families, who many of who uh, made some pretty lavish claims at the beginning of the conflict about their ability to raise thousands of soldiers and defeat the Houthis in a matter of weeks and many of whom disappeared after being given large cash payments. Um, the Omanis, however, tend to have a better understanding, I believe, of what's happening in, in the south of Hadramaut, um, and what is happening in Aden, in Nahaj, in Abyan, and Shabwa in particular. Um, so what is also needed right now 
is good local understanding of dynamics in Taz, in Adan, in Lahaj, um, in Shabwa, in Abyan, and in Hadramat. Um, the, because again, the issue is that a peace deal between the Houthis and the Hadi government has no real meaning in terms of the conflict on the ground. That's to do with the Saudi bombing campaign. So that's what that agreement would mean. You then will basically need a number of other peace agreements at a local level if there is to be actual peace on the ground. Because again, the Saudi slash Hadi, um, if you like, uh, cooperative uh, relationship is one aspect of this conflict, but it has many other dimensions. So the Imanis could be very useful in helping resolve some of those conflicts in, in the South. In terms of Iran, obviously I'll point you to my Chatham House paper um, on the subject, um, Yemen and the, the Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia Cold War. Um, I think I can't, couldn't agree more with, with Noel. This has been low cost um, for, for the Iranians. They can spend $1,000 before the, the, the war broke, broke out. They could spend $1,000 and it would be $10 million by the time it became um, a news item in the Yemeni press. And the Saudis have acted pretty much the way the Iranians, I think, would like them to. And I think the, the drag on resources, the fear they have over, over their border, I don't think we, we have a full understanding yet of quite how nerve-wracking what's going on in Yemen has become for the Saudis since the bombing campaign began. But from, I think, an Iranian perspective, this isn't a terrible um, outcome. And again, they, they've given limited logistical support to, to the Houthis. They haven't had to give them many arms because Yemen is awash with arms and the Houthis now have the entire of Yemen's military resource. So from an Iranian perspective, this has been a low-cost speculative bet, which has paid off. Um, and at the same time will actually be useful in terms of their bargaining within the region because as they try and rehabilitate themselves, they can present themselves as a far more rational actor than, than the Saudis, while at the same time fanning the, the flames as and when they need. Um, and in terms of addressing the GCC position, um, there is no GCC position. Um, I understand that, that uh, this, this event um, is being uh, sponsored to decree by, by um, the, the US GCC um, cancel, but um, I, I have to say there is a Saudi position on Yemen, there is an Emirati position on Yemen, there is a Qatari position on Yemen, um, there isn't really a Kuwaiti position and there is an Omani position. Each of these countries has a different interest in Yemen. Um, the Emiratis are supporting southern separatists because they are worried that they do not have influence over um, groups other than Sunni Islamists. The Saudis are mainly by this point working through um, conservative service Sunni Islamist groups in Yemen, which is worrying about their, their regional neighbours. The Qataris have their own networks and continue to support Islam through 2011, when the Saudis were taking an increasingly anti ikhwan anti-Muslim Brotherhood position, and so on and so forth. So maybe the first thing the GCC can do is actually create a unified position on Yemen, and one which is aimed at creating a positive outcome for Yemen itself, rather than one that creates leverage for them within the, the wider region. Could, could I just, just make one point on, on that? Um, it sort of came up uh, uh, earlier. The, the problem, uh, I think, when looking at sort of the, the peace in Yemen is the, is the um, different groups that are fighting uh, the Houthis in different parts of Yemen. There isn't an overall sort of clear leadership, so you see tribal groups, particularly in a, a, a place called Marek, which is critical to the world, what's going to happen because it's the oil and gas and power stations are there, where a tribal lands has been fighting the Houthis for quite a long time. And then you go to what's happening in, in Aden and Taiz and, and uh, Padramat. It's, it's different, uh, different parties involved, written and overall. They're anti-Houthi, um, uh, as much as anything, but they're not leaked. And this is going to be a very difficult, I think, for, uh, in, in sorting out Yemen after all this, uh, this happens. Apart from the fact that the uh, AKP, uh, the Al-Qaeda presence in, in, in Hadramat, which I think, just to, I think these groups are like, I just say that it, it, it's much more of a deal between AKP and local uh, local tribal alliance uh, and AKP. I, I think it's, it's probably incorrect to say that, 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 that they're in control, which is you see in the media that they're part of a of a group which is controlling, and, and it's limited to the coast area, the, uh, the Wadi Hadramat up in the north, where there was an uh, army. Part of the army has remained very clearly loyal to, to uh, President Hadi. Uh, the uh, AKP have been chased away. Um, your answer to this question uh, may include uh, a, a restatement of, of some of your responses already, uh, but the question was nicely put uh, that Ms. Uh, Al-Hamdani 
uh, made reference uh, and a phrase to the Houthis uh, being in places where they do not belong, quote unquote. Um, where do people belong in Yemen? Uh, Dr. Anthony, in his remarks, uh, mentioned about eight different places that have sort of subnational dynamics, identities, loyalties, allegiances, tendencies, inclinations, what have you. Uh, uh, but uh, can you address this aspect of the Houthis being where they do not belong? Where do they belong? And uh, who belongs? Where in a way that will likely determine the outcome. But, but I think we did say at the, at the beginning, I tried to, I hope I made the point clear, that the Houthis, it, it, they shouldn't be seen simply as a militia. It, this, is a, this is an organization that, that builds tribal allies. And even a place like Shabwa in the, in, in the salvage of the large provinces uh, next to Hadramaut, um, uh, they've been able to exploit tribal differences there uh, to, to ally one part uh, and um, push them out of the side. Um, and, and this is what they're steeped So, So I think it's important to, 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 to remember there may be Houthis, but they, they also have, a, have allies in different parts of, parts of Yemen. And the Ansarullah political slogans uh, it, it does carry um, uh, real messages for, for, for Yemenis, particular sort of problems we have heard, so I wouldn't write them off uh, in, in that way. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, with, with the Houthis, where do they, where do they belong? Um, to, to my mind, all the Yemeni parties belong back around the table of the National Dialogue Conference um, in a context where everyone has a real conversation about a democratic and uh, transparent collaborative future. That's not happening right now, though. Um, I was in Aden, um, I think in October of, of last year, when the Houthis started sending emissaries publicly down for, for the first time to try and convince uh, al Hirak al Janubi, the, the southern movement, the separatists, that they could work alongside the Houthis. And I think it was the first time, along with tribesmen uh, in the south of Idlib, where they found an area where they could not do um, the job they'd done elsewhere, and they sent their best people to try and convince them that they could all work together. Um, one of the issues that we haven't really touched on um, today is, is the issue of the South in Yemen and, and its future. Um, when Iraq were approached by the Houthis, they, they said, it turned out quite correctly, that the Houthis would be no different from Islam, from the GPC, or from any other northern force, and that they would want to enforce unity and they would want to do that in order to, to the southernist minds, exploit um, unity. And the, the problem about this conflict is that, to my mind, on a psychological level at least, it has dealt a death blow to the Unity Pact of 1990. Now, whether or not that means that unity will not be enforced in, in the future, that's an entirely different question. But the, if the Houthis did not belong in certain areas of, of Yemen before, we're now at a point where regional differences are so heightened um, that it is very, very difficult to see a future for, for unity in Yemen. So that's not 100% um, answering that question, but it is speaking to, to a bigger point where sort of perceived resentments and grievances in, in the South, which in many cases had legitimate roots, um, are now 100%. And, and the treatment of civilians and the wider population in Aden in particular has been, been shocking and I think has created a situation in which north-south relations within that odd thing of actually north-west, south and, and east relations in, in Yemen um, are possibly irreparably damaged by, by this point. Uh, two uh, different questions here. Uh, both of you are from the uh, eastern side of the uh, proverbial so-called metaphorical pond uh, there. And most of us here are from the western side of that uh, metaphorical pond. Um, there are more than superficial differences between uh, the United States and Great Britain uh, in terms of their perceptions of Yemen, uh, their involvement uh, uh, and engagement with Yemen, and the way in which they perceive their respective needs, concerns, interests, key foreign policy goals. Uh, would both of you comment on the implications of these differences and perhaps spell them out a bit more? 
in one of the seminars that we uh, are currently uh, offering uh, some 25 interns from all over the world in the United States uh, called the Raven in the Gulf, we make the point that uh, Americans have trouble with tribes. Uh, American diplomats say to uh, your colleagues uh, who recommend that the United States have a more positive or even a neutral view towards tribes would maybe help. Uh, we say, oh, no, we don't do tribes. And uh, many uh, Americans of an age have seen dozens of uh, cowboy and Indian movies. And in all those cowboy and Indian movies, the tribal people are the so-called bad folks. Uh, they are swarthy, uh, more aggressive, oppressive, um, backward, illiterate, etc., etc., etc. No neutral stereotype about Indians and, and our tribe the people in the United States. The cowboys were invariably white, and they were invariably good, and they invariably won. And your country, you don't have anything remotely comparable uh, to this as a socializing effect on young people. Uh, and it's not surprising that after the United States invaded Iraq in 2003, and your uh, countrymen recommended to our government uh, representatives, you should work with the tribes. And we said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And but finally, we came around rather late to do it. So what are the differences between our two countries' approaches towards understanding uh, of and dealing with Yemen? And you might throw in for good measure the impact of the drones. Uh, you're not using this as a tactic. Here it's appealing because it kills fewer Americans. And that's a domestic uh, strategic objective. It's economically cheaper. And it, it, uh, of its honor rate, so it absolves one of having boots on the ground. Please address this phenomenon, and then one quite different from it. Can Ali Abdullah Saleh be uh, resurrected in some de facto way as an individual that held the country together uh, for decades, not years, as two immediate predecessors uh, dying a little more than a year in office? Uh, it doesn't have to be official, Rasmian, but um, it could be in the shadows. How did he uh, get to work with the Houthis, and what might be his uh, future uh, position and role? Is he part of a solution, potentially, if not actually? Uh, I think he's waiting for the phone call. Uh, but um, I, I think he's probably... It's, it's difficult to... I mean, if in the, at the end of the day, I mean, peace still will have to deal with realities, uh, and there's a reality of, of, of this power. But uh, it's very difficult to see someone like Salah uh, return to power, given, given his record in office. And also various UN, you know, the number of UN resolutions have imposed sanctions on him, and excluding him from, uh, from, from office. So it's a... It, it's, it's a it, it's going to be a particular difficult role, but he, I'm sure himself, would like to become a kingmaker of some sort. And, and as long as those, those networks remain, uh, and he's, he retains the loyalty of the, of the military, and those military, and the, 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 his military assets must be must be uh, being degraded by what's the, by the you know, kind of uh, bombing attacks. Um, um, but but uh, I'm sure that that will be his aim to try and uh, uh, present himself. But I think. That the rest of the world are and Yemen would, would want to uh, exclude that, uh, that, that happening. Um, I, I, I won't say much about, uh, as I actually, on, 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 on policy terms, I don't think there's a huge difference between the US and the UK on this issue. Uh, but on counter terrorist uh, uh, policy, I think there has been, um, I think it's been perhaps more in the forefront of, 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 of US uh, policy towards uh, Yemen. I, I'm certainly until um, uh, the transition period when I thought when I thought there was some move towards and and more, and more generally in in, in in the Western world towards an understanding that you can't fix terrorism in Yemen without fixing the problems of Yemen and, and the, the the Friends of Yemen program that the economic aspect of the transition was designed to uh, address the sort of issues that that uh, uh, the, the, the key to giving the Yemenis a decent. Uh, living standard. Um, drones, I mean, it, uh, one of the 
uh, I say current problems, is that the, the counter-terrorist forces that were, uh, that were trained by, uh, by, uh, by, by the West, uh, the Central Security Forces, um, have been uh, are now part of the the, 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 the people that are being attacked by, 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 the, by the Arab coalition. Um, so the very forces that are there to try and stop terrorism uh, are being degraded at that moment. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda in, 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 in Yemen has always had uh, an international as well as a local agenda. I think this has been the, 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 the problem. If you go back to the, the uh, about five, six years ago, the attack I, I mentioned on the, the Christmas Day attack, and there have been several others like this. Then the activities uh, of Anwar al awliki and the way that he used the internet uh, and, and publications to to uh, generate uh, 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 terrorist activities abroad. Uh, so it's, it, it's a real, real problem. It's that international aspect of, of it, which has been a problem. It's also had a local aspect. But one of, the, one of the points to remember is, I think that the, the most ardently anti-AQA people and ISIS people in him are the Houthis. Uh, when when uh, uh, AKP tried to work in, in, in one half Yemen or Baida with uh, tribes to, to um, uh, it came to, to be defenders of Sunni Islam uh, against the <coughs> they got rather badly mauled by the uh, uh, by the Houthis. Uh, okay. Just just to reiterate uh, Noel's point, um, there's very very little daylight between UK and US policy um, on Yemen, or has not been for the better part of um, 15 years. UK policy in Yemen, certainly until um, 2011 was to follow America's lead um, uh, on CT. And CT was, was the priority. But basically, the, the UK supported the, the US CT mission. CT, counter-terrorism. terrorism mission in, in Yemen. Since 2012, there has been some divergence. Um, I think the UK was probably more keenly focused on the, the national dialogue as a, a solution. Um, it took point on that um, to a greater degree than, than the US did. Um, I also think there's an assumption when people look at the UK, um, especially in the south of Yemen again, that the UK, because of its experience in the country, historically has some great institutional knowledge and memory of, of Yemen. Um, outside of the case of a, a few individuals, um, that institutional memory as embodied um, in, in Noel right here, um, has been very poorly used by the United Kingdom in Yemen. Um, and their attitude towards tribes, I don't think, has ever been any better or worse than, than the US is, really. Um, in terms of drones and the, the, the drone war, um, that's a different topic. Um, it's, it's something we could spend all day debating, and people have debated for a long time. Has it ended al-Qaeda in Yemen? Has it proven an effective tactic? Has it won hearts and minds? No, no, and no. Um, Salah and rehabilitation. Um, again, going back to this question of regionalism, any peace settlement that leaves Salah or his family in any amount of power effectively precludes the continued success of that settlement inside far as it pertains to the rest of the country outside of the northwestern islands. So um, it's it's yeah it's a catch twenty two to to get peace in Yemen. You probably need some sort of settlement with Salah. But any kind of settlement with Salah means that the peace deal is inherently unsustainable. Um, yeah. You know, just one final point. Was, I think something has been quite remarkable about the last four years <coughs> internationally is the degree of consensus that's been on the UN Security Council. So you've had the Russians, the Chinese, the Saudis, everybody backing the, this, this transition deal, backing the sanctions, um, um, and, and imposing these, these deep sanctions on, on, on Saudi, and indeed some of the Houthi leaders. Although, unfortunately, in, in the shape of 2216, yeah. that consensus has now ended, yes. and um, yes. Yemen is increasingly yeah. coming into the yeah. sphere, not just of the Iranian Yemeni, sorry, Iranian Saudi Cold War, but also the US, yeah. the Russian Cold War. Yeah, that was, yes. And of course, they didn't, uh, the, the, that resolution would have affected very much the current uh, 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 war. Um, how could a US Iranian rapprochement? Um, put Iran's policy in Yemen on the table, if at all. Uh, 
one of you have said that the Houthis are a proxy of Iran. So what is the next step in the Saudi Arabian-Iran uh, Cold War? Could this war escalate into a, a direct uh, conflict? Oh, that would maybe have a yes or no answer, so we'll rephrase it. How, if at all, uh, could this war escalate into a direct uh, conflict? Uh, where and how should the international community invest in order to see a more stable and progressive Yemen? The question many have before this violence broke out, and uh, each of you talked about the conditions of poverty and the massiveness of it. Uh, the technology and the economics for water desalination have been around now for nearly 80 years. Most of the technical breakthroughs started with high per unit cost, but over the year got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Com cameras, watches, uh, the like. Um, how and why can one um, use this as a device? If people do indeed want to bloom where they're planted and not be forced or compelled to migrate, uh, how can one operationalize uh, this aspect of investment along with the other ones in terms of priorities? And lastly, this uh, national dialogue, 500 plus representatives and the extraordinary number of amendments, uh, is it totally um, off the table now, irrelevant? Uh, to what uses, if any, might it still be put? Well, that's it. That's it. First one. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, all, most of the, uh, in, in the UN resolutions and, and what President Hadi of the Saudis talk about, the Arab coalition refers, keeps referring to the outcomes of the national dialogue. So this, this does remain very much on the table. But who sees tend to focus much more on the, uh, the PNPX, sorry about these initials, but the, the, the one that they signed in September 2014 uh, with President Hadi. Uh, which had a mechanism in it for revising uh, the uh, out outcomes of the national dialogue uh, and possibly for the revising the draft constitution in, in, to give them what they uh, or, or, what, what they wanted. So, so it's very much on, 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 on the NDC uh, is, is very much on, on the table, but I say that the, the, the Houthis wanted as modified by the uh, PNCA. But, whether they can come back to it, I don't know, because the, the you know, you know as we, we've been saying, what sort of Yemen we're going to see at the end of it, we just we just don't know. Uh, but that, that's the, that's the formal position. But we determined by what happens on the on, on, on the ground. On de uh, on desalinization, <laughs> it's just there's actually this book that we're both uh, taking part. There's actually a chapter on it in, in this uh, in, in ties. because it is a, I don't think very many, it's a very serious problem for some of the Yemeni cities because you know they're, 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 uh, the the geography is that you know, they're at five six thousand feet above sea level, uh, and desalinization uh, needs to be pumped from from uh, from the coastal areas. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a potentially very large cost. Uh, uh, the, the, this, this book describes the desalinization uh, as, as being taken into Thais, uh, where these problems are less. But when it comes to Samar and some of the other areas that uh, will be affected by uh, running out of water in the next, uh, uh, it, it, it varies, say, two or three decades, then, then desalinization is, uh, and the cost of desalinization, but the cost of have to be involved in. Um, uh, um, the, the power for it, but it is clearly the sort of thing that GCC, if if as the all the this want to be part at least up until it started part of the GCC, uh, that that would be part of a, a, a longer term uh, piece. Of it. Um, okay, um, I'll, I'll have a crack at the US uh, Iran rapprochement. Um, can it and will it make a difference? Possibly, but maybe not in the way that we might um, expect. There is a view to which I partially subscribe, which is that while Washington has put some pressure on the, the Saudis um, to think very, very carefully about how to engage in Yemen tactically, um, it has not brought the political pressure that it could to, to bear on, on the Saudis because 
um, it wants to maintain this relationship while being able to deal with the, the Iranians. Um, my concern would be that that pendulum may actually swing further once a deal um, has been completed, that the, the US yeah. will feel the need to, to, be, to show its steadfastness in its commitment to, to working with um, the, the, the Saudis um, and the GCC in an even stronger manner than it has thus far, despite the, the unfolding tragedy in, in Yemen. Um, that's speculative, though. Um, but I think that if Iranian-US relations um, do continue to improve after the deal, there's absolutely no guarantee that if the deal is completed, that they will. Um, there is a possibility that in the long term, um, the US will be able to, to maybe, and other international actors will be able to leverage a better relationship with, with Iran to have a, a more three-dimensional view of, of Yemen and maybe find a way of building a better relationship with, with the Houthis. Because again, as Noel said, um, any deal in Yemen will have to involve the Houthis. Um, and if this, the rhetoric that has been around for a while, which is basically why don't they just go home, lay down their, their arms and just pretend they don't exist anymore, um, that's not going to be very, very helpful. And given that pretty much everyone in Yemen is at a, in a place of, place of power because of their military might, um, I, I don't see why they, they shouldn't be dealt with on, on some level. Um, could the Saudi Iranian Cold War develop into a hot war? That, I think, is actually one of the greatest fears um, in, in Western capitals about what is happening in Yemen right now. Um, there's a real sense, certainly in conversations that I'm having, um, which you can see quoted in, in sort of the various um, enterprises I have as a, a, a journalist, um, but certainly there is a, a sense that this lashing out at Yemen, the bombing of Yemen, is really being presented and viewed in, in the kingdom in Saudi Arabia through the prism of we're actually doing this to Iran. We can't bomb Iran itself, so we'll bomb Yemen as a proxy for Iran in the same way that the Houthis are being presented as a proxy for Iran. Um, and that could well well spill over. We're seeing a much more aggressive um, uh, administration in, in Riyadh, um, so, so who knows? I hope not. Um, and I think not um, really found to the other two questions. Okay, last question, um, uh, punctuated by semicolons here. Uh, there's been some talk about uh, uh, refugees and the long queue of individuals seeking uh, visas and largely ineffectively or inadequately or unsuccessfully. Uh, there is a non-for-profit uh, organization in Saudi Arabia willing to financially support any and all Yemeni scholars who seek to uh, depart to pursue their higher education. And uh, this is, uh, would be a much welcomed uh, investment and a uh, more positive role um, uh, on behalf of the humanitarian issues. Uh, we, the hope of the questioner is that the two of you would incorporate into your remarks uh, anything that you could do to facilitate this idea of taking hold. Um, and then no one has talked about drug trafficking uh, or mentioning COT, not taking a position as to whether COT, Q-A-T, COT, uh, <coughs> Adulis is the Latin word for that leaf, um, uh, being a drug, but um, it does have an impact on its imbibers, or rather its chewers. Uh, you chew the leaf and you imbib the juice uh, from the effect of the chewing. Uh, those who see pictures of Yemenis looking like as though they have something between a golf ball and a tennis ball in their cheek, it's not, they've not been stung by a bee. Uh, no, it is the result of having uh, considerable amounts of this particular leaf in between their gums and their cheek. Uh, no other country in the Arab world has this uh, phenomenon or challenge. So there that, are that two questions here, the refugees um, and the educational humanitarian component of that, the visa component of that. Uh, there is the drug trafficking. Uh, no one's mentioned cut there. No one's mentioned much about civil society in Yemen. Um, its civil society was extraordinary. Uh, Margie Ransom and others are fully aware of this. Trade unions, political parties, freedom of speech, almost an excess of freedom of speech at various uh, times in elections. 
of which I was an observer in all of them, uh, not necessarily free and fair, but almost the same, uh, open and transparent, uh, certainly com in comparison to some of those in the past under a city called Chicago and uh, uh, further back in a city called New York. Uh, could you comment on these uh, questions? And there's one about uh, uh, Ali Abdullah relationship with Al Qaeda and his relationship with the uh, Houthis, um, dynamics of it, causal effects of it. These are the last uh, questions. Uh, well, I tried to address the first one. I hope at the, 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 the beginning, of, I, I don't know how it, how it arose, but very clearly a, a, a deal was done between uh, Salah and the Houthis. I assume it was done something in, in, in late 2013, I think initially it's perhaps also directed that their, their common enemy is Islam in, in, in this instance. But it's, it's clearly become a fact of life. I think what most people ask is whether it can last. I mean, how long could it last? Because given the history of the, of, of the conflict uh, in the 2000s, after all those wars of the, uh, of the 2000s were fought by a, a government led by Al Abdel Saud against the Houthis. Um, so it looks to me like a, it's sort of almost a tribal pact. It's, it's, it's um, where people cooperate for a while to pursue a common interest, but people will separate. So that would be the, the key question to me, whether, whether, it, can, whether it can last. On, I, 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 I actually lived in, in, in the PDLY, which was banned cut uh, so you can accept at uh, weekends. And the other amount was banned completely. Um, so I, I brought it up in a, in a different way, and I noticed it's one, one of the things that the, this new Al Qaeda, what do you call it, administration is done in McCullough, is to ban the sale of cut. So uh, that's, um, um, but no cut, I mean, there, there are enormous, and, and there are enormous problems caused by cut, but the, 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 the converse is that it, it's something like, I think, 12% 12, 12 of the economy is. And in, in terms of rural economy, it is actually uh, extremely important in transferring money from the urban elite to the rural areas. So there are, there are sort of costs and, costs, costs and, uh, and benefits. Um, okay. Yeah, I didn't talk about that. Um, in terms of the research, Shisala, his relationship with Al-Qaeda, his relationship with the Houthis, from the, the perspective of Sala, it just speaks to, to the man. He is... Um, a ruthless pragmatist in getting what he wants out of a, a situation. He will work with anyone in any way um, to, to get the outcome that, that he requires. Um, and he has proven himself again and again to be a master um, manipulator. And the only person comparable really would be General Ali Mossin, um, who had his own networks, uh, it would appear, allegedly, um, within Al Qaeda. In terms of the Houthis and the Houthi Salah Pact, um, it was a period when I was in Yemen when all this was going on. I think it's a little more complex than people have presented it as. Um, I don't think it was, some, you know, a bunch of Iranians sitting down with uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh and Abdul Malik al -Houthi. Um I think that Saleh convinced people from within his network, tribal leaders from the northwest, Hashemites, people he knew to cooperate with the Houthis as they came south. And as they knocked Isla out, I think the, the plan from his perspective was that there would be a final showdown on the outskirts of Sana'a um, between Ali Mossen and his people, um, Isla and the Houthis. Um, and I think that Sada possibly received support here from outside in order to bring this plan to bear, effectively to completely knock out the capacity of Mossen and Isla. I think the plan failed on the 20th of September the 21st, when Mossen told people from Islam, from his, his loyalist military units, from the people who had been brought into Sana'a to lay down their arms because Hadi would not stand alongside them, because he saw what was unfolding. I think one of the reasons we saw such a, an unleashing of anger from, from the Gulf when the Houthis suddenly were in charge of Sana'a was that there had been some understanding in terms of what was happening, but that the plan had gone so horribly, horribly wrong. That's my own perspective in conversations from research conducted there, and I think that Saleh, coming back to this first point, is a ruthless pragmatist, and once he realized that the coalition of Saleh slash Houthi was on the front foot, why stop here? And in terms of the Houthis, it's a well-learned adage, militias from minorities who are marginalized, when they get on the front foot, don't turn to, tend to have learned the lessons of the past, 
and to treat everyone with, with um, a light touch, they tend to try and take as much as, as they, they possibly can. Um, the refugee crisis, um, while I'm going to choose my words carefully here, um, while I have the utmost sympathy for educated Yemenis abroad, um, who have been stuck in um, other countries and unable to return to Yemen without educational opportunities. I'm afraid that I have greater sympathy for Yemenis who were already poor and have been displaced internally and are locked inside the country, who cannot cross over the border into Saudi Arabia, who cannot cross the Makra Desert into Oman, and cannot simply jump into the sea. And when they do escape from the country, end up in um, refugee centers in Djibouti. Um, we've reached a situation where Yemenis are trying to flee the country for Somalia. Yeah. That is some seriously bad stuff, but that is an internal dynamic. And again, while well, I have nothing but sympathy for relatively educated people um, and their need to, to continue education abroad, I do feel that the higher priority should be displaced people within Yemen and those who have arrived um, on the east coast of Africa. Uh, a very pessimistic note on which to end, but it, it underscores, uh, italicizes, neonizes, uh, capitalizes the complexities of Yemen too. Uh, imagine the following, uh, that uh, until these crises, um, Somalis would uh, flee to Somalia, to uh, Yemen. There are tens of thousands of Somali refugees in Yemen from before this crisis. And uh, uh, Yemen looks after them as best it can with the uh, paucity of resources it has. But the situation in Yemen, being one that Peter just alluded to, where Yemenis fleeing Yemen are trading up, so to speak, by going to Somalia. Try to get your mind around that 